Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I think we'll get, get started here. So this is this is organic spectroscopy, and it's a course I've been teaching teaching for a bit, and I'm really looking forward. Um, I am not a spectroscopist, and that's good because when I started to teach this course, my thought was, oh my God, I'm just somebody who uses spectroscopy and have been using it for a long, long time to solve these problems. I'm not a theorist, I'm not a computational jock, I just use it for organic chemistry. I realized that's exactly what people want in learning this course. So what I'm going to do over the next 10 weeks is share my take on spectroscopy with you and how to use it to solve these uh, we're going to be going over a bunch of different techniques, and I'm going to try to break it into sort of core techniques that I think that I think valuable. Um, I'll tell you a little more about that when I tell you about the syllabus. Here's the website for the course. The website has some copyrighted materials, not my own materials. I don't care about my own materials, but I do care about respecting other people's copyrights. And so right now the site is unlocked, but it'll be locked, and then you can get the materials under what's called fair use copyright law, meaning that a professor can give a handout to the class, but can't just sort of broadcast it on the internet if the handout is a little piece of a book or a paper or a journal or anything. All right, the website will have your assignments. I've already made a tentative schedule of assignments. Uh, it's probably a good idea to check back on this in case we change anything. I know, for example, there will be a few minor changes to this, although nothing, nothing major here. I've uh, got a bunch of class materials here. We'll be pulling on these at various times. So, for example, our first, um, our first discussion section will actually focus on molecular modeling, and there's an exercise here that will be we'll be pulling on that. There's also some software. Was everyone able to install the software okay? Mac people figured out Mac person, but I don't just name. Um, <laughs> Mac people figured out how to rename? I think so. All right, so we'll be drawing on that. We'll get one, one exercise in during our first discussion section. Um, one thing I'm doing, I always like to try to do things a little differently in the course. It keeps me, keeps things interesting for me. Uh, also, I like to try to get people's feedback on the course and then incorporate it into the next, next year's version of the course. So like two years ago, people said it would be really good to have a practical component of the course, meaning learning how to run these experiments. And so we implemented that last year. And then people said, well, it's a lot of work. Can you cut back? And so I've made some trimming to that. So give me feedback as we go along. It is going to be a course with a lot of homework. And the assignments will get thick and fast at the end. I'm pretty liberal about giving extensions where you need it. And I know last year people said, oh, it's really heavy. Can I get an extension? It's like, okay, can we get these problems done on time for our Monday discussion section? Then you can get an extension on the other stuff. So let me know if things get really unmanageable. We can cut it, cut stuff. If you're not comfortable coming to me, come to Ryan, who's in back, who is the teaching assistant for the course and an ACE student from, from last year. All right, let me tell you what I want to us here. All right. So as I said, here's the textbook. Here's the uh, website. It'll be password protected with a absolutely trivial name and password, just something so we're not broadcasting all this stuff to the whole class. Textbooks. The Silverstein textbook is a really good one. There are a couple out there. There's one I, I absolutely love and have assigned as a reference book, but it's not really readable and not really friendly, and that's the, um, the Phil Cruz book, which is a little more hardcore. The Silverstein one, I think, is more accessible. There's a supplementary book, and it's really a table of reference compound, uh, of reference uh, values, and it's by Pretch, and I hate to make people spend money. Um, last year, I think, and in past years, people have found this is really handy to have. If you're looking and saying, well, Silverstein's already was 120 bucks or something for 
for if, it, if you're saying it's a lot of money and you want to share the patch book, you can do that, but I think it's useful to have. All right. As I said, I want to incorporate a molecular modeling component to the class. And the reason I've done this is so much of our thinking as organic chemists involves stereochemistry and conformational analysis. Organic spectroscopy, as most of you are going to use it, is not about what I'll call structure bashing. It's not about you get this wildly random unknown compound and you have to figure out the structure. That's part of it. You get some surprising product from organic. But usually you have some idea what's going in there and it's more specific questions that you're asking. I got uh, something where I know the basic structure but something's changed or I don't know the stereochemistry and I want to probe it. Molecular modeling ties integrally to those types of questions. And as we get into topics like coupling constants and the nuclear overhauser effect in NMR spectroscopy, those are going to be very relevant. It's going to be extremely useful to have molecular models. This is also part of the standard toolbox of practicing organic chemists to be able to make simple molecular mechanics-based molecular models. And it'll tie into 201 and 202 when you get conformational analysis. So we should be able to come up to speed on that in a single workshop and exercise. We'll do that on Monday. My license for the software actually allows me to distribute it to all of my students, which is kind of cool because I paid 800 bucks for, for this full license. And then they said, but you can give it to all of your students. It's like, well, then darn it, I'm going to share it with as many of my students as possible. So the one thing you really, really need for this, and, I, and I'm not kidding, because I know you can use option control, but you're going to be using those anyway. He's a real free button now. So you should be able, if you're a Mac person, you probably don't have one of these or wouldn't have had one of these. You can get it for like nine bucks or ten bucks, I think, in the bookstore or if you have it something. You need it by Monday for our, our workshop on there. The other thing that you need for the class is a real ruler. Not one of these kid rulers from elementary school, a real scientific ruler. I recommend one of these clear ones here. I know the probably mill one chem stores or bookstore. Anyway, it's on the website. You'll be using that to measure integrals and, and so forth. All right, let's see, what else do I want to say on here? So we're going to start with a week talking about infrared spectroscopy. You've had this in organic chemistry. I'm going to give you my perspective on what's important. We'll get some exercises to work things in. We're going to then go for about a week on mass spectrometry. And one of the travesties in the teaching of mass spectrometry is it still is so focused on electron ionization mass spectrometry while people are moving away from that. We'll have one set of problems, one you know, group of problems that ask some questions related to that. We'll have probably one, one lecture on that. But there are concepts I want to bring in on exact masses and isotopic abundancies that aren't, aren't hard. They're not particularly profound, but it'll be nice to have a chance to go over. So we'll spend about three lectures on that. We're then going to move on to NMR spectroscopy. And we are going to actually spend a solid lot of time on 1D NMR. And the reason comes back to this concept of analysis. You get 1D NMR spectroscopy as a software. And you kind of get the basics, but there are a lot of concepts involving coupling and other things that are really, really important and splitting patterns that give you deep, deep information. And I want us to really master that. We'll be applying that in problems of analysis. Then the midterm exam is actually going to focus up to this point. So we're not going to have a D for the midterm exam. That'll be at the end of, end of week six of the class. And concurrently, we'll be picking up and starting 2D techniques. And I'll give you a basic suite of about six, six 2D experiments that really constitute core knowledge for the material, because you can easily get lost in the alphabet soon. All right. I wanted our problem sets uh, to be sort of a capstone to the chapter. The real learning is going to come from working problems. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to get together on Mondays and discuss the problem. So as I said, first Monday, next Monday, uh, this coming Monday, we're not going to have 
problem set do will get together in 108 and have a workshop on molecular modeling. And the second one will be uh, some IR ex exercises and um, and the modeling exercise that go hand in. The third one will be uh, will be uh, in a uh, mass spec and so forth. Anyway. Come prepared. Uh, we'll be discussing stuff. You can annotate your homework before handing it in. Let's see, what else do I want to say? So, so the exams, I like the idea of open book exams. And I like the idea of taking time. Basically, the exam is a problem set where you're going to really be working a lot. There's one closed book part to the midterm. And I want to give you time because it takes time to do problem sets. And so uh, we're going to have them spill onto uh, onto Saturdays and be be open and new here. Let's see what did I say for the, uh, the dates of them. Uh, yeah, November fifth, uh, and then we get the final exam. The final exam is going to be December tenth. Grades. Uh, graduate school is about grades. For the most part, everyone is going to get an A. It's not going to have a huge impact in your graduate career or grade, but it's going to have a huge impact for you in terms of how much you learn. Because what you really want to be shifting from as you come into graduate school is getting away from this mindset of being a student where the grades actually are for something to being an independent scientist, where what counts is your ability to solve problems and analyze problems. And just about all of you are going to be using our spectroscopy as part of your toolbox for solving research problems, and it just behooves you to be as good as you can be. To put it another way, this is a really scary time to be getting a PhD in science because pharmaceutical industries and others have contracted, and there isn't a lot of room out there for people who are not as good as they can be. So when you're thinking about stuff to motivate you, of course, an A grade is on the back and it says, yeah, you're doing a good job, that's nice. But really the bigger picture beyond that old pat on the back, I got a 10 on the problem set or I got a, a 95 on the midterm exam is the fact that you're not this and that's what you should be sure. So midterms count, the midterm counts, the final counts, discussion, uh, problem sets and class participation count by all right, office hours, um, come by and catch me. Feel free to catch me in my office. Um, I think Ryan is also going to have some office hours before the problem sets are due. So I think he's picking the area outside my office. I'm 4126 Natural Sciences 1. He's picking the, the area outside of my office, that little interaction space with couches and blackboards right after. Is, does, do people have anything on Mondays, right? Is there a discussion on Mondays at, at any time? TA meeting. TA meeting. All right, Ryan, why don't you, and at 1 o'clock, some people have lab course, or? Ryan, why don't you send out a sign-up sheet, and just, you know, or, or an email, and just find out what works. You sign up, you sign up sheet, and see, see a couple of times. Lab probably runs to 5 o'clock. How many have one day left? Anyone? How many people have TA meeting on Monday? I heard a lot of people. Okay, so it sounds like maybe, maybe two o'clock or something. People are probably need a break to eat after two meetings. So maybe it sounds sounds like can we aim for two o'clock on Monday? I think four would be better. Four? Yeah, let's do. I'm sure. Let's do four, four o'clock on Monday here outside my office. All right. As I said, homework counts. All right. Academic honesty. Um, at a graduate level, I don't think anybody is intending to choose your course. What I'm asking of you is to not go back to last year's problem sets from previous, because these will be the same. Last year, I'll be not to go back to last year's problem sets from previous years. I understand people work together. I think that's okay. In fact, the whole theme when we come in is going to be you're going to bring your problem set. First thing I'm going to do in discussion is say, 
do you have any questions, uh, or more specifically, which questions do we want to discuss? And then people will be going to court. And you can annotate your problem set and get credit for it. I do ask you to annotate them in a different color pen. Uh, you will get credit. I ask you not to use the discussion section as a chance to basically not do your homework and then figure out, figure that you can fill in everything. Um, obviously, there's a difference between working together and not doing your own thing. And I'll give you a perfect example. Most of the NMR problems are going to involve some level of analysis in addition to structure solving. In other words, you may be solving a structure, but then you're going to be assigning Honestly, you get a structure and it's not the right structure, and then you talk to a classmate and they say, oh, I got this structure, and you're like, oh, that makes sense. You still have the analysis part of the problem to do on your own and figure out where those residences are. That's a perfect example of doing your own work after having consulted, after having done it before, and recognizing the fact that it's not simply copying all their assignments their residence assignments. If you're copying their residence assignments, you're doing it wrong. Similarly, in the practical component of the course, I think it's great for people to go down to the NMR spectrometers together to have cooperative learning on shimming and locking. But if you're not collecting your own FID and processing your own FID, and you're just submitting a classmate spectrum, that's not, not OK. It's not working. Do you want us to make a little note if someone did give us that idea? I think, I think that's great. I mean, it's honestly, it's not going to hurt you, and I think that's a wonderful way of transparency. You know, in, in professional science, we've started to move more and more to this. Not all journals do this, but one of the things a lot of journals are doing now in authorship is asking the authors to submit what each author contributed to the paper. They're asking all authors to take responsibility for the scientific paper, but they want to know what each person so and so did the laboratory work in the paper. So and so was the professor and guided and entered the students and helped write the paper. That's the sort of thing they want to know. So I think that type of transparency on the work at this level is fantastic. I would love to see it. All right. Other questions or thoughts on that part? Or just in general? All right, I guess the last thing, be here for the class. And by that I mean be here, not on Facebook, not text messaging. It's probably not necessary to graduate class. Don't be, don't be cruising around the internet. Yes, I'm gonna get up videos of the class, but be here for the class. One person already came to me, and this was a great example of good use of video, and said, I can't make Thanksgiving due to needing to travel back east. Um, and it's like, great. Well, we'll have it up there on video and just download them and feel free to, to use them as you want. All right. I'm going to, I have a list of topics and we're going to be going through those later on, but I think I'd like to, I'd like to at this point get on with today's talk and start talking about IR unless there are any, any other questions. Where will the um, will, will the videos be posted on the site? The videos will be posted on the site. This is an experiment this year being done as part of UCI's Open Courseware program, which is being run by Larry Cooperman, who's doing today's today's videoing. And so the hope is that they're going to end up, in addition to on the site, on the Open Courseware site, on iTunes U, on YouTube, and a bunch of places. Which actually brings to mind something. We're not going to discuss. We're not going to film the discussions, with the exception of the molecular modeling one, which is kind of the same format as a regular class, but maybe we'll be around darting back and helping out. So for the most part, the video is catching the back of your head. If you're if you're shy or concerned that you don't want anyone to see you see the back of your head or on YouTube, basically just sit out of the out of the course of the video camera. But no one is going to be filmed at the blackboard. Exactly. Unless, unless you want to be, in which case, um, here we go. So come on up and talk about it. <laughs> All right, I want to, I want to talk about IR spectroscopy, and I want to give my, my take on it. I really believe for those of us 
for doing reactions that involve any sort of interconversion of functional groups with molecules that are not huge in size. Um, you know, basically, maybe with the exception of some of the things in my group, which involve a lot of really, really big molecules. For people who are doing synthetic methods, synthetic methodology, or just anything that involves the synthesis of building blocks. IR spectroscopy is really the first technique you want to be reaching for when you run your reaction. IR spectroscopy is good at identifying functional groups. And for the most part, when you are running a reaction, you're doing something that involves changes to functional groups. You're adding a nucleophile to a carbonyl compound, and it's going from a ketone or an aldehyde to an alcohol. That's a huge change. And this is the sort of stuff that IR shines at telling us about. And to some extent, NMR does. And I want to give you an example from my own graduate work that was just a revelation. So basically realized every experiment you're running is testing a hypothesis. You have an idea. And the question becomes, what actually happened? So I was running a reaction. I expected this to just be a simple alcohol reaction. I had uh, thiophenyl acetate. And I wanted to do an aldol reaction where I treated it with LDA and then treated it with cyclohexanone and then did an aqueous workup with H3O+. And what I expected to get, of course, was the aldol product. And what I got instead was a product with a really strong band in the IR. at 1820 wave numbers. And I knew my data was screaming at me. Because the reactant, you should be running your reactants, IR and NMR. You should be using your chance to do chemistry to educate yourself. Your, the reactant, the thiophenyl uh, acetate, has a band, a carbonyl band, at 1710. <coughs> and so you'd expect the product to have a band at, 18, at, at 1710 for this and maybe an alcohol band at about 33-40. And this thing was hotly huge. I mean, it was tremendous, and the 1820 stands out like this one. Of them. And I knew exactly what it was right away, and I thought, this is really cool. And it turned out this ended up being the basis for the rest of my dissertation and a patent I filed on the work. It was a discovery, and that was cool. What had happened was, under the reaction conditions, even at low temperature, it cyclized the form of beta lactone. Not, not surprising in hindsight, but unexpected. And actually a compound that was way more useful than the alcohol product. And so that was cool. IR can tell you that type of information in an instant. Now, all right, I want to talk a little bit about how IR works today. Then I want to talk a little bit about my recommendations on running IR experiments, because I want them to be easy for you to run. Again, my take on things for theory is very, very basic. It is like an organic chemist, because that's what I am. And the theory is basically that we're looking at transitions between quantized vibration states. All of your molecules are going to be in the ground vibrational state, and you're going to be exciting them to the first vibrational state. The most important vibrations are stretching vibrations. And stretching vibrations are exactly what you'd expect. You'll have a bond, and it stretches. And remember, think back to peak chemistry zero-point energy, even in the ground vibrational state, 
your bond is vibrating. If I want to represent it in very simple language or simple diagram, I can say here's a CH bond, and it's not static. It's getting longer and shorter. And what's happening is when it absorbs a photon, you kick it up a notch, and it vibrates more quickly. And you're looking at that photon getting absorbed. All right, one thing, and this is really of practical importance, is that while we can think of a bond as an atom connected by, a, uh, as a, a ball connected by a spring to another ball, right? Your basic quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator. What's happening with many vibrations in a molecule is they're coupled. And there are practical implications of this. And I'll show you one example today and another example when we talk about anhydrides. So, okay, so CH2 group, not very exciting. Not a really hot function. The CH2 group, you end up having two vibrations associated with it. One is a symmetric stretch. At 2850 wave numbers. And by a symmetric stretch, I mean if my body is the carbon atom and my, my fists are the hydrogen atoms, we're talking about a motion like this, where the two are moving in concert. And then another stretch, an asymmetric stretch. At about 29, 25 wave numbers. And so an asymmetric stretch means one bond is getting longer while the other is getting shorter. And you have this type of inserted motion. So, most of what you're going to be looking at, just because it's in what we'll talk about as the functional group region, are stretching vibrations. Also of importance are bending vibrations. And by bending vibrations, I just mean a scissor motion where the bonds aren't getting longer and shorter. And again, you get coupling between these motions. So for example, on a CH, I'll just diagram this on a methylene group. You can imagine this sort of as a scissoring in and out, like so forth. And here you're also going to have two. You're going to have an in-plane. Five wave numbers and an out of plane ending at 1380 wave numbers. And this is below the main functional group region, so you're not going to be paying a heck of a lot of attention to it. All right. There's a really important principle. And you'll see the practical implications of this in a second. For, for regular IR spectroscopy, not Ramon spectroscopy, which actually is covered in the newest edition of the textbook that, that I am currently in the process of reviewing, for regular infrared spectroscopy, an allowed transition the transition that you can observe has to involve a change in dipole moment. So let me give you a really simple example, which you will actually see inadvertently as part of your work in the course of using an FTIR spectrometer. So carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, just as I said, on coupled vibrations, you're going to have coupled CO stretches. So you have, here you have a really big coupling. The symmetric stretch is at 1340 wave numbers. 
and the asymmetric stretch. is at 2350. So remember, the symmetric stretch is like this, and the asymmetric stretch is like this. Which one of these stretches actually has a change in dipole moment? Only the asymmetric stretch. So the 1340 stretch is inactive, and the 2350 stretch is active. And the practical implications of this is if you're using an FTIR spectrometer and you go ahead and you put your sample in the cavity, you're putting carbon dioxide in the cavity. And you will actually see little bands. And with CO2, you'll actually see the rotational fine structure. But you'll see this little fuzziness at about 2350. And that's your breath. That's the carbon dioxide component of your breath. So the other practical implication of this becomes for functional groups. So if you take something like an alkyne, and so let's take as our example two pentones. So normally, you would see a carbon-carbon triple bond stretch. And 2-pentine isn't exactly symmetrical, but it's pretty darn close. And so you are not going to see the carbon-carbon triple bond stretch. So what does that mean? That means if you're saying, oh, I'm looking for an alkyne in the IR, and you say, well, I don't see a band at about 2100 in the IR, so I can't have an alkyne, you're going to be wrong because you're just not going to see it because that stretch is for all intents and purposes not active because you don't have change in the dipole moment. If you go to a terminal alkyne, where now you have some dipole to the bond, right? The CH2 group, an alkyl group, is an electron donor, so this end of the alkyne is going to be a little more electron rich than this end. So I can designate this as delta minus and delta plus. Now, when that CC triple bond is stretching, you're actually changing the dipole moment. Why do you change the dipole moment? Well, you have two partial charges. And as you increase the distance between them and decrease the distance between them, the dipole changes. So when you excite it to the first vibrational state, or the, the first excited vibrational state, you get a change in dipole moment. So here, you do see the CC stretch, the C triple bond stretch, seen at about 21, 20 wave numbers. And I'm going to say it's sort of moderate in intensity. Carbonyls really stand out at you. That beta lactone I gave you as an example was the strongest peak in the spectrum because you've got a really big dipole for a carbonyl, and it's even bigger for beta lactone because of polarization of the bond. But here you're going to have a weaker stretch. So, all right, another example if I put on on my alkyne, if I let's say have an alkoxy alkyne. Let me take methoxypropyne. So which way is this triple bond going to be polarized? Which end is going to be more electric with more negative charge on it? This end is Right. Just think resonance. Oh. Think like an enol, because it's just an alkyne version of an enol ether. Oh, okay. So the oxygen's pushing electron density in, so you write a resonance structure like this, kick in here. So you've got a delta minus and a delta plus positive. So here again, you're going to see it. And this is actually strongly polarized. So this will be, this will be strong. So IR spectroscopy really can talk to you about what's going on in your I mean, certainly in the example I gave, talk, talk to me. All right, I want to take a moment at the 
very simplest level to discuss part of the theory, and that's simply the effect of bond strength and mass. And I'll show you a couple of practical examples. So if you think back to your peak camp, and you think back to your harmonic oscillator, your quantized quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, you probably saw a diagram that was something like this. You have two masses connected by a spring with force constant K. Everyone seen something like that? Oh. And you probably remember a solution that involved the term reduced mass. Does that strike horror in the back of your mind from PCAM? All right, so if you solve this oscillator, you get that nu bar, that's your frequency in wave numbers, is 1 over 2 pi c times root k over mu. Mu is the reduced mass, k is the force constant, and mu is equal to m1, m2 over m1 plus m2. I'll talk more about, about new bar in a second. I'll talk more about wave numbers. But I want to give you a very, very simple practical application. I want to tell you the why is why I'm telling this. So you take a CO single bond, and actually, let's start with a, a CO double bond. You take a CO double bond, right? A carbonyl is going to be at about 1,700 wave numbers. So I'll put a little tilt on, a little squiggly. That that's about. Now, off the top of my head, I might not know, or for the purposes of this course, really care a huge amount where a CO single bond shows up, except I might want to know is it in the functional group region. And so I'm going to tell you where it typically is at, and it varies a little bit, but about 1,100 wave numbers. And you look at this ratio. And you say, okay, what's he saying to me? He's saying, if you double the force constant, you increase the frequency not by a factor of two, but by a factor of the square root of two. And so it makes sense that a single bond isn't going to be half of a double bond in its frequency. It's going to be about one over root two. If I had 1,200, it would be 1 over root 2. And single bonds vary here. So, so I'll say almost, I'll say approximately 1 over root 2 here. Now, why is this important? Well, let's say we talk now, instead of about a carbonyl, about a carbon-nitrogen double bond. And you'd say, well, I don't know that much. But I know that you know, I haven't seen imines, or I haven't worked with imines. But I know that the reduced mass of nitrogen you know, once you plug in here, right, because you've got 12 and you've got 16 for oxygen or 14 and you've got 12 and 16 or 14, the reduced mass isn't going to differ by a heck of a lot. And the bond strength isn't going to differ by a heck of a lot because carbon-nitrogen bonds are pretty similar. So you'd say, okay, now, even if I didn't have a table, even if I didn't have a lookup, I could say, you know, imines are going to be somewhere here. And conversely, you could say, okay, where's my carbon-nitrogen single bonds going to show up? Well, they're going to be somewhere about here as well. And so you can bootstrap on information with just a little bit of knowledge. And I think that's one of the really, really important things. I'll show you another example. Another example. Let's take let's take chloroform. Chloroform is a common solvent for running IR spectra in these days. Cl3, CH, and I'll tell you that it's at about 3020 
wave numbers. And so, okay, if you want to be lazy, it's not a crime to be lazy. If you want to be lazy, because as I said, you should be getting an IR spectrum, not saying, oh, well, I'll get it when I write the paper and do my thesis and do my orals and characterize things. This is a question you're asking. So, okay, you want to be lazy and throw your NMR sample in an IR cell, and you don't even want to dissolve it up, and you say, okay, where does CL3D show up at? Okay, well, the force constant is going to be the same. So it's just the reduced mass that's changing, right? So, so mu for CH, and I'm not going to use exact numbers. I'll just say 12 you know, plus 1 instead of 1.007, whatever it is. Um, over 12 plus 1 is the reduced mass for a CH bond. And for a CD bond, the reduced mass is 12 times two, right? Deuterium is a heavy hydrogen. It has, has an extra neutron in there over 12 plus two. So here we have 12 thirteenths, and here we have 24 fourteenths as our, as our numbers. The force constant is going to be the same, so you can take this equation, you can back out the force constant and the one over two pi c term, and you get that nu bar CH times root mu CH is equal to mu bar CD times root mu CD, right? That's just from saying, all right, we're going to going to back this out over onto this side and equilibrate and put the two halves in. So we get 32, we get that 3020 times root 12 over 13 is equal to mu is equal to nu bar CD times root 24 over 14. So I would predict that the number for our CD stretch, the wave numbers for our CD stretch, is at about 22, 16 reciprocal centimeters. And that would be a pretty darn good prediction. I mean, remember, this idea of treating this as an isolated mass, just the carbon without coupling to the chlorines, is an approximation. The actual is about 2250 wave numbers. So if you end up throwing your sample into your NMR sample, into an IR cell and taking a solution phase R, IR, and you see a peak from the deuterochloroform, that peak is going to be right at about 2250. And so don't say, oh, I have an alkyne, or oh, I have a nitrile, which is another thing that shows up about it. All right, so I've glossed over this issue of frequency. And I just want to come back to that for a second. All right. So let's come back to our carbonyl as sort of the archetype for IR spectroscopy. So 1700 cm to the negative 1, the term that we use for this unit cm to the negative not one is wave numbers and so what do i mean by by wave numbers so that's our that's our v bar our new bar term so what do i mean by wave numbers well wave numbers is equal to waves per centimeter. So in other words, when the light travels one centimeter, you have 1,700 waves. Well, if you have 1,700 waves per centimeter, then your wavelength is 1 1,700th of a centimeter That's your lambda value, and that's equal to um, 5.9 times 
times 10 to the negative 4 centimeters, or 5.9 microns, 5.9 micrometers. Now, you typically run a spectrum from, say, 4,000 to 600 wave numbers. That's sort of where a typical IR spectrometer works. So you're looking at the 4,000 end from about 2.5 microns to about 17 microns. If you ever grind a sample to make a KBR pellet, and you don't grind it fine enough, you don't grind it so your particle size is below about three microns, then the light at the shorter wavelengths is going to get scattered and not absorbed by the particles. And this is actually pretty common. If, you're, if you don't do a good job of grind, grinding your sample, you're going to lose the CH region of your spectrum, right? Because that's at like 300 wave num 3,000 wave numbers. So, so that's at like 3.3 microns. So if your particle size is bigger than 3.3 microns, you won't see your CH peaks. And you'll say, my gosh, I make a compound. It's got to have some CHs in it, but I don't see the peaks. All right, let me at this point take one moment to talk about the instrumentation. So the instrumentation uses an infrared spectrophotometer. And I'm going to show you two real flavors of this instrument, but first I want to show you a fake flavor of the instrument to get it in your mind. In the simplest concept, so this is only a concept, in the simplest concept, what you are doing is generating IR light, meaning heat, wavelength light, from a glowing coil. It's passing through the sample. It's getting absorbed at different frequencies. You are breaking up the light with a grating or prism. And again, this is a schematic, an oversimplification. And you are detecting it. At the simplest level, you are simply looking at what light of what frequencies is being absorbed. In practice, there are many implementations of this idea. The, the simplest is a double beam instrument. In a double beam instrument, you're actually comparing the amount of light going through a sample and the amount going through a reference. So you have a source. The source is going out through a sample and a reference. It's coming to a mirror that's allowing the two to be compared. The mirror is going to a grating or prison. And that's going to the detector. And there are still some of these instruments in the department. All right, that is still easy to understand conceptually because it is the, the exact same concept as my gross, gross, gross oversimplification here, making up for the reality that your cell may absorb light, that your source doesn't produce the same intensity of light at all wavelengths, and so forth. Now, the instruments that have become very popular are FTIR instruments. And in an FTIR, it's a little bit more complicated, but the ideas are the same. The big idea you need to absorb is the idea of interference. And if you don't completely get it, you're still fine. You have a source. Your source produces light. You have a beam splitter. And what the beam splitter is going to do is it's going to allow half of the light to go one way 
half of the light to go another way. So you have half of your light come up to a fixed mirror, and half of the light goes out to a moving mirror or variable mirror. And the variable mirror rides on a piston. And what's happening as the mirror is moving is different wavelengths at any given moment are getting interfered, some constructively, some destructively. So in other words, as the mirror moves, the mix of light, it's no longer white light coming out of here. It's white light in which certain frequencies have been removed, certain frequencies have been enhanced by interference, and those frequencies are going to vary. Your, your, your light goes to a sample, it goes to a detector, and it goes to a computer, which takes the interferogram, which basically is the position of the mirror, and works it backwards so you get out the, the strengths at various frequencies. You will typically run this with a, um, with a reference. All right, I want to take one last moment, and I apologize for going over, just to talk about sample prep. And I want to give you my personal take on this. This is a little separate from what you'll see in the book. All right. IR has changed a lot. Back in the days where NMR barely existed in the 1950s and 60s and even into the 70s, JOC, Journal of Organic Chemistry, wanted people to report every peak. In other words, you were creating a fingerprint for a company because you didn't have a lot of other data. Nowadays, JOC says, look, tell us about the functional groups in your compound. Report just the important peaks. And usually that doesn't even mean CHs in your sample. It usually means carbon yields and double bonds and uh, and alcohols and nitriles and triple bonds and so forth. And that's the question you're typically asking when you're carrying out a functional group interconversion. You're probably not looking for aromatic, aromatic CHs or aliphatic CHs. You're probably looking for alcohols and carbonyls. So make it easy. All right. One of the techniques, the, techni the reason people don't want to run IR is it's a pain in the neck. Making a solution is easy. You do it for NMR. No one, no one complains about doing NMR. I'm a big fan of solution IR. Again, if you go back to the old days, you would use carbon disulfide and carbon tet, so you would get every peak clear. That's the reason work. 5% solution in chloroform and CH, pardon me. CL3, you'll lose a couple of bands in there, you'll see some blackout regions. So you lose the bands of chloroform at 775. Typically, if you're using an FTIR, you'll see very strange patterns associated with, with interference here, where just no light is getting through. But that's super, super easy in a 1%, in a 0.1 millimeter cell. Now, my other beef about IR, and this comes from being a PI who's bought far too many sodium chloride cells, is you get one person who gets the cell wet and they've clouded the thing. I am a huge fan of calcium chloride cells. I've used this in my synthesis lab class for undergraduates. We bought two of these cells and I expected them to get broken with a bunch of undergraduates using them. They've been using them for a couple of years now. Calcium fluoride doesn't dissolve in water. If you get water on it, it doesn't hurt. The cells cost a couple of hundred bucks a piece. Some of the TAs in the course told their PIs to get one, their advisors to get one. Calcium fluoride cuts out below a thousand wave numbers. In other words, you don't get light through it below a thousand wave numbers. But that's no big deal because as I said, we're going to concentrate on functional groups. You make up a couple of tenths of a mil injected into the cell. Everyone knows about KB. Who, who's made a K, who hasn't made a KBR color? Who's enjoyed making a KBR color? <laughs> okay, a couple of you. 
great. Grind your fancy sample fine. If you're making KBR pellets, I'm a big fan of a ball mortar called a wiggle, which you use in a wiggle bug, which is a dental mill. You shake it up. One big KBR. One big sample per 100 mates. KBR with lots and lots of pressure in the cell. Just grind it fine. Another one that you probably haven't seen is a neutral mull. Mull is just a fancy word for suspension. Neutral is a fancy word for mineral oil, which is a fancy word for hydrocarbon oil, alkane oil, that has those bands I talked about at 2850 and 2920 and 13, 1380 and 1465. You just take three megs of your sample, grind it up in a mortar and pestle, or I am a big fan of frosted microscope slides. Grind it together 10 seconds with a teeny tiny drop of oil, scrape it onto a salt plate, and you get a spectrum that has your CH bends and stretches. But that's okay, you just ignore those for, you know, for the oil and you see your function. Groups. Anyway, that's my take. We will talk about spectra and functional groups next time. Uh, we'll see you on